Even if you give them more supers, stuff above them, even if you try different control methods, look, a colony has to reproduce. April and May are months that I have to really be on guard against possible swarming in my hives. What happens is, in case you're a brand new beekeeper or you don't know much about honeybees, honeybees love to reproduce and make more bees in the spring. That's why, that's just simply how bees reproduce. They actually will raise queens in their hive and half of the colony will leave with the older queen that's been in there for a few years. So they will fly away and form a new colony. They'll pick a place, maybe a, an abandoned tree or someplace, an abandoned cavity somewhere, and the honeybees will make a new colony there. Meanwhile, back home, all the queens that they raised while the queen was still there laying eggs, they raised those queens out, and basically they have a big fight in there. All the queens kind of fight each other until there's only one queen left, and then she will rule the roost, and she'll be the one that will be now the new queen back in the original parent colony. So this time of the year, it's kind of tricky, and today I'm going to show you how I deal with preventing swarming. I simply fabricate a swarm. So what I like to do is go out to my hive and a hive that is uh, so full that they're gonna swarm, I'm gonna have to actually kind of simulate a swarm in the colony. So what I'm gonna do, and it works really well for many years uh, for me, I simply go out to the hive and I usually like to find the queen, although finding the queen is not all that critical because what, what we're gonna do is actually divide the hive up. Now you don't have to do an, a completely equal division. Like let's say you have 20 um, brood nest area frames coming out of winter. You really don't have to divide it 10 in the old hive and 10 in the new split. You don't have to be exact like that. If you wanna take out, I usually say at least you need to take out four or five frames minimally to make a split. You want the bees to have enough brood, resources such as honey and pollen, so the new colony that you made into a split, you know, can get along a little while, because sometimes in the spring we can have colder rainy days until it warms up um, in the daytime, or you can have a rainy spell. So you want to have enough uh, frames in that colony uh, that you're splitting so they can survive for a while. Let's just go for the sake of, uh, you know, understanding it more clearly, let's just do 10 for 10. So you're gonna take 10 frames and, and take those as a split and you're gonna take leave 10 frames behind for the hive to expand in. Um, if you don't make a split, nine times out of 10 for an overwintered colony, they're gonna, they're gonna swarm. They're gonna do it anyway. So about half of the colony will swarm because that's called a reproduction swarm. And so you might as well you know, keep your bees and prevent them from leaving. So this is what I like to do is take, uh, let's say in this case, let's just um, take maybe five or six frames. So I'll put a deep box next to the hive that I want to split and I'll just start going through the hive that overwintered. I will look for uh, frames that have things on them that I want to put with my split. Now again, it's kind of up in the air what you want to do with the queen. You can leave the queen behind and, or you can take the queen in the split. But here's, here's a really important part. No matter what you do, if you don't know where your queen is, you have to have eggs, visually see eggs, and leave eggs in both the original colony and in your split. You have to have eggs if you don't know where your queen is. Why is that? It's because if you don't know where your queen is and you don't leave any eggs in, let's say, the uh, split, you don't have any eggs there, and you didn't move the queen over there, there's no way they can raise a queen. So always have eggs in both. Also, if you're making a split, it really is a good idea to have um, brood in all three stages in both colonies. And that allows this overlap of workers so that you don't have big gaps. And by three uh, types of brood, I'm talking about eggs, larvae, and capped over brood. So if you can have brood in all three stages in both your original colony, we'll call it the parent colony, and in your split, have frames making up. See, when we make, we sell and make up nucleuses, they're called nukes. And when we make up a nuke, we're essentially splitting a hive. So we go into one of our overwinter colony, uh, we find the queen, we pull her on the frame she's in with brood on it, put that in the new five frame nuke, and then we'll add a, a frame or two of additional brood, honey, pollen, resources. We're kind of making this tiny little um, hive essentially with all the resources they need to be strong. So that's what we need to do when we make a split. 
And so you can go through your hive as you see here and you can just look at these frames and you can kind of say, okay, here's a frame of eggs. I'll think I'll put that over here on my split. Now, once you kind of balance out your uh, parent colony with the split you're gonna make, you feel like you have uh, good resources in your split and you've left plenty of resources in the parent colony for them to all be okay. There's equal amount of brood in both, for example. Then you have this scenario that's sort of a problem. And that is all the foragers that you've moved over into your split, they know the location of their of the parent colony. So when they go out on a foraging flight to get nectar, pollen, water, or something, and they come back, they're gonna always come back to that original parent colony. So when you take your split and you move it away somewhere, your foragers will leave that area uh, wherever you move them to. Once they get airborne and they travel, then they recognize the landscape and they know exactly how to go back to the original location and they won't go back to the location that you moved your split to. So what are you supposed to do? This is so frustrating. Well, the obvious thing that you can do is actually move your split at least two miles away. And by doing that, hold on, I know that sounds outrageous, but let me explain it, then I'll come back to answer your question. But if you move it two miles away, then what happens is the, the foragers don't recognize the landscape, so they reorientate. We call it taking an orientation flight. And they get familiar with their new surroundings and they go back to the split because it's in a place now that they don't recognize, so they have to reorientate. That's one way to do it that's sure fire. Now, most beekeepers don't want to fool with trying to figure out, well, what's two miles away that I can take my bees to? How do I take my bees? In my car trunk? Do I get a pickup truck? How do I transport bees? That's not a fun thing to do either. So what are other options to try to get foragers to stay with the split that you make? Some of the things that I've tried over the years have worked marginally well. I say marginally because they don't always work, but they work pretty well. They, well, they work well enough for me to continue doing it. <laughs> and so what I do is I try to move the new split that I've just made to a location that's different uh, than the original spot. But you're right, when they, if it's not more than two miles away, then there's a chance the foragers will fly in the air and they will recognize the landscape and go back to the original spot. But here's something that I've found works about 75 to 80% of the time. And that is if I place something in front of the split, after I make it, I move them, let's say I move them, I don't know, 20 yards or 100 yards on my property, um, if I put them in front of a different shaped building, or if I put something like one here, you can see I put my golf cart in front of my split by putting the golf cart there right in front of the entrance. I'm hoping that the foragers will fly to, or, or walk out to the uh, flight deck or the flight runway, and they'll see something in their way. And they'll think, hmm, I don't know if I trust my original uh, location, my GPS. Uh, uh, so maybe I'll take a new orientation flight since things look a little different on takeoff. That does cause some bees to do that. I have actually uh, used my video camera and I filmed uh, foragers that are coming out and taking a new orientation flight in a new location. So it does help, but still I've done it enough time to know that many of the foragers will go back to the original colony. So let me just tell you that I think what I'm gonna continue to do is put something in front of my hive because I don't wanna fool with dragging them out on a trailer two miles away and I'm gonna keep um, actually doing this next step. Now, this is interesting. Before I get into my next step, let me encourage you guys to please subscribe. Bobblehead David is here and reminding you guys, please subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to make content that is really helpful. And if you appreciate that, then hitting the subscribe button and click on the bell will let you guys know every time I make a new video. Now, another thing that is really important to understand is that one of the things that I do is I know I'm losing foragers from my split. They are some of them let's say even 20% or, 20, or maybe 25% are going back to where their home is. So, but I need more foragers. So what I will do in some cases is I will actually take, I'll swap locations. So I will take my hive, that is my split in the new location and my parent colony, and I'll just swap them for like half of a day. Now by doing that, if I take my colony that I made a split from, I made a split, then if I take it back to the location of, their, of the, where they were originally, then all the foragers are going back into the split. 
They will. They'll just fly. If you put it in the exact location, they'll go right back into your split. So you have foragers bringing resources such as food that the split needs. Now you can do that for half a day and swap it back. So by doing that, I know it's a lot of work, but by doing that, it really does help kind of equalize the, the foragers are just bringing food in, right? So it helps you equalize the food resources they need to grow. So that can buy you some time. In the meanwhile, since you have brood in three different stages in both colonies, including your split, eventually new foragers are being uh, arriving at the age of 23 days old where they're going to take their first orientation flight from the only location they know is the new location of the split. So by having brood in all three stages, you're hoping that new foragers will quickly uh, take over the role of foraging for the new split and you don't have to rely on or worry about losing that uh, foragers from, from your split. So that is one way to do a split and there's lots of ways to do it. And let me just say, I like to say this quite often on my videos, I don't feel like I have the only corner of beekeeping knowledge at all. There's many people that are smarter than me, but there are many people that do swarming control and making splits in a lot of different ways. I'm just telling you in my scenario where I live with my experience and knowledge, uh, I like to make splits this way because it has worked out really well for me. So that's the way I do it. So if you wanna try this way that I've just described it, it might be really helpful for those of you that have just overwintered a colony, congratulations, through the winter. And now you know they're gonna swarm, you gotta do something. Doing this might really be the answer to help you deal with an overpopulated colony in the spring that's bound to have a reproductive swarm. Even if you give them more supers, stuff above them, even if you try different control methods, look, a colony has to reproduce. If bees don't reproduce, all of our bees will be gone. So bees are wired to have a reproductive swarm and make a colony out of the overwinter colony. Now, I'd like for you to leave comments below on your swarm control method. Maybe you'll uh, be able to share light on our beekeeping community here on my YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, no approach is dumb or stupid. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, some could be if you tried something that doesn't work with bee biology. But for the most part, there's so many different swarm control methods or ways to make splits. Share in the comments what you're doing now that it's swarm season to control swarming or to make splits in your area. I'm always so pumped and excited to make videos because every time I make a video, I feel like I'm really talking to a friend. So it energizes me to get in front of the camera and talk to you about beekeeping and sometimes other things of life as well. One of the things that I wanna thank you for is many of you have joined up to become a member of my YouTube channel. Now, this is interesting. It's something I started last year and it's a way that you can help support my uh, mission of making more videos here on YouTube. And it's simply becoming a part of the channel and it's known as YouTube membership uh, for my channel. And I have many members that have joined and we're actually gonna have a live stream with just my members this coming Sunday on April the 14th. Now this live stream is a way that I can interact and talk and share with my membership. Those of you that have come alongside of me to prop me up, to help me financially, continue making videos in beekeeping. I appreciate that. So if you want to join and become a part of my YouTube membership before the live stream uh, for members this uh, Sunday, April the 14th, you still have time to do that. At the bottom below the video, there's a join button. Look it over carefully. And again, the, uh, what this is involving is me simply uh, enjoying time with you. I have occasional live streams and uh, by becoming a member, you're making a financial monthly contribution. I have two different levels. You can become one of my Nectar novices, or you can become a Beak Squad ambassador to support me financially. And so I appreciate that so much. Look it over. It may not be something you're interested in, uh, but if you are, I do have a live stream coming up for memberships this coming Sunday. This will be the second one I've done with my members. So check that out. And as always, one of the things I love to do is teach. And I love teaching on beekeeping. I've got a lot of speaking engagements coming up where I'm speaking and teaching on beekeeping. But I also have so many online beekeeping courses. And if you've never seen those, here's a link right here to our website. I'd love for you to take a course with me. It helps so much in beekeeping if you increase your education so you know what you're doing. And I'll have a uh, link in the description below for my classes as well. And if you wanna watch a video right here where I show you how I'm making splits, here it is. I'll see you guys over there.